My name is Peter Ustinov, and uh, I'm uh, no one in particular, except that, of course, I'm distinguished from others because I'm sitting in a red sofa in the middle of a field. It doesn't happen every day. Apart from that, I'm, uh, I'm an actor and a playwright and a novelist and uh, various other ancillary activities. I'm a member of the French Academy. I was knighted by the Queen, and I'm Chancellor of Durham University. I'm President of the World Federalist Association and Ambassador for UNICEF uh, for the last 30 years. Apart from that, I've really done very little. And of course, between these poles of happiness and unhappiness is life as it is lived. And uh, one has to steer one's own way through the minefield. And uh, I think it helps if you learn to enjoy it, to enjoy the challenges, not to be frightened of them. I'm an optimist simply because I think the alternative is too frightful to contemplate. I think I'm an optimist because I know how sad, how challenging, how, how miserable, how unfair, how unkind life can be. And I think a pessimist is somebody who finds this out new every morning. Nothing makes life unlivable apart from death, and I haven't tried that yet. And I'm not very keen to start the experiment. I have no definition of happiness, really except uh, that uh, happiness is one of those abstract ideals uh, which uh, are on everybody's horizon. And like perfection, you know that you're never going to get it entirely because time, it moves, it isn't static. And uh, perfection is something you always have to yearn for in the hope of never entirely reaching because it'd be too good to be true. Happiness, basically, I'm an extremely happy man, but I don't mean to say that I'm happy all the time. And then, of course, if you ask me the opposite, uh, what is the uh, description of unhappiness? I think it's mainly if you're not satisfied with yourself, because in life, I think you have to set yourself fairly high standards. You mustn't put them out of reach, otherwise you'll always be unhappy. Uh, make the whole game possible by putting happiness within reach. And uh, happiness, like everything else, is a compromise. But compromises can be highly successful if they're done properly. I think uh, probably the most interesting thing that ever happened to me is being born. And it's a source of infinite regret that I can no remember the details anymore. I, I just can't. I've tried very hard. But uh, I know I'm cheating if I make it all up. So what's the point? M most of the good things in life you have to guess at or try to remember. You can't remember your birth. And, um, but I do believe that education is frightfully important. Not the way you're educated, the way you educate yourself is much more important. And uh, that education ends with death or thereafter, according to your religious beliefs. I uh, don't really have any compelling ones. I believe in goodness, in human goodness. And uh, consequently, I believe in evil because they are inseparable. They're, they're incompatible, but they, you can't imagine one without the other. Uh, apart from that, I'm prepared to be surprised at any moment. Uh, now, if you ask me what the worst thing that I ever did, I really can't remember the bad things that happened. And I'm sure I did frightful things, but uh, most of them were, were mean. You know, at school, uh, for instance, I, I'm sure I, uh, I did frightful things, or things which were considered frightful. Uh, by other students, but I can't really put my finger on anything in particular and say, oh, I wish I hadn't done that. Uh, memory is a very soothing thing, and it takes away the unpleasant things. 
It's when it starts taking away the pleasant things, then you know you're getting old. Uh, uh, one of the uh, essential decorations of life is art, because I always divide things into things which can be explained and things which cannot be explained. Science, chemistry, the wonders of the universe are things which are being unraveled every day. And of course, it's like Kafka a little bit. The more doors you open onto the unknown, the more doors you find behind them. So we'll never know quite everything, but again, that is what I meant earlier when I talked about perfection. It's something to reach for in the hope we never reach it. Uh, and uh, art is something which cannot be explained, which is felt, and it's uh, just as important as the other. At the moment, science seems to be all important because we're rushing forward into an unknown world with this extraordinary capacity of making things that we thought were out of reach within reach. Art will always be out of reach, and it's no use bringing it within reach. It loses all its value. And even a great scientist needs to read a good book on occasion in order to spend a short time in a world where not everything is explained, but only hinted at, only felt. We're at the moment hearing the intrusion of science into art. It's so strange that I interviewed Mr. Mandela the other day, and he said to me that he really was thankful for the 27 years spent in prison because it allowed him to meditate which is a function which everybody who is forced to make decisions in this world should really have to go through. And since he's come out of prison, he hasn't had the time anymore. Well, I know what he means, of course. Uh, one's relationship with other people is tremendously important, but it's very important also to have some time to yourself and to begin to s distinguish, and I think that only comes with maturity, between solitude and loneliness not at all the same thing. Solitude is something which is very necessary in order to find yourself. And uh, loneliness is a regret that you're alone. It's not at all the same thing. And uh, so your relationship with other people is very important because you really only discover who you are in relationship with other people. And then you can meditate about it afterwards. That's nobody's business but your own. But the contact with people is what life is really all about. Of course, the, uh, this whittles it down to the other occupants of the globe. I talk about other people, but you can divide those into men and women. And nowadays, there are all sorts of other variants of this. Uh, including, I must say, children who are tremendously important, who always disappoint us in the long run because they grow up, which is an awful thing. It's like, I always think of uh, sentimental ladies who love to play with lion cubs, but they really shouldn't extend their welcome uh, unnecessarily because overnight lion cubs, who are so sweet, become dangerous. And it's the same thing with children. Overnight, they become men and women and become dangerous. And I have great respect for babies because they have the only real international language which exists. It's much more generally used than uh, Esperanto or Volapük or any of the other variations of attempts by man to create an international language. When one baby says to another one, <laughs> The other one knows exactly what is meant. The mother thinks she knows, but uh, she doesn't really know as well as all that. And babies communicate with each other the world over in a way which is absolutely unique. And it will help us enormously if we have the humility as adults to uh, try to understand babies better and children most of all. Because I think that when you come to a country like Cambodia, which I visited not so long ago, you find out that is entirely
entirely the fault of adults, what has happened to the whole country. It's part of real politique and all that nonsense, the grandiloquence of politicians who bombed it out of existence. And once carnage becomes a habit, as it does, then there is no end to it. It creates Pol Pots like mushrooms in a field after rain. And that is an example of how we should not be behaving. Luckily, of course, in the course of human development, uh, nuclear weapons are now obsolescent, simply because, like all things, they priced themselves out of the market. So uh, even fighter planes, if two of them crash, it really has an effect on national budgets because it's so expensive. What, n countries ask themselves if they can afford such luxuries, especially if they're not usually going to be used. As for nuclear weapons, they're absolutely obsolete. It's therefore surprising that recently we've seen India and Pakistan still testing them. We always thought they were old civilizations. Nobody imagines they were old-fashioned civilizations as well. And so uh, the trouble with uh, Cambodia, as a, to come back to that, is that landmines were used which are now getting cheaper and cheaper to produce. They can be done anywhere. And that makes it really the most feared and the most disgusting weapon around because it's so easy to manufacture, because it takes place in real estate to which there is no particular claim and which people can't remember where they put these mines. But children are ingenious and always on the lookout for playthings. Ah, and that is tragedy. And so uh, my relation with uh, women are usually more intelligent than men. The trouble with women is when they enter politics, very often they become men instead of remembering that they're women, whereas, which is their real value. Uh, Aristophanes wrote a play called Lysistrata in which women went on strike in order to avoid men doing stupid things. It's still one of the most, and in fact it's become one of the most actual plays in existence, written thousands of years ago. And so women are invaluable. In fact, personally, as a man, I wouldn't know what to do without them. But that is neither here nor there. Uh, they are a wonderful adjunct to men. Uh, men are uh, necessary adjuncts to women. And together, the children are the only lasting examples of uh, human ecstasy, the results of human ecstasy. And because of that, they should be given a little more importance than they are in the world today. That's a question I've been asking myself for a long time now without any satisfactory answer. I don't know. I uh, tend to be very rational in my behavior, and uh, I would be a humanist, in fact I am in a way, uh, if I didn't look at the wonder of nature and decide that there must be something behind it. What that is, I have no idea. I wrote a book in which God and the devil appeared, and God said, oh, the devil says, first of all, it's terrible, really, I'm beginning to realize now, after all this time, how many people were tortured and killed throughout history because of what they believed, and how relatively few were killed and tortured because of what they were. Because usually people who behave wickedly in this world are in a position to do so. And uh, people who just believe the wrong thing, well, that's their own prerogative. And God replies and says, yes, I think prayer is what's important. I don't give really, uh, I don't really care very much to whom people pray. A prayer in itself puts man in the right relationship to the immensity of the universe. He creates uh, his own image. But since uh, I am supposed to be everything, says God, I'm, uh, I'm also the volcano to which the pagans pray. I am the tree or the moon or the sun. Uh, I'm even the clay feet of the false god. So really, what difference does it make to whom people pray, so long as they do 
pray or at least meditate. The devil suggests that since they're only on earth for a short time, he should pay his respects to the Vatican. And God is appalled and says, oh no, I, I'm, uh, I'm not nearly well enough dressed for that. I have no idea. You have to ask Professor Laszlo. Uh, I personally have no theories about it. I'm quite resigned to, uh, to be nothing after death. People have asked me what I want put on my tombstone, and I thought, please keep off the grass is the best thing I can find. Uh, <clears throat> if there's something out of death, I, I hope it's pleasant. Uh, I hope that some of the theories of other religions aren't real, that one doesn't because one's behaved badly, become a snail or something with uh, uh, rather more limited possibilities of uh, comprehension. But uh, if I am a snail, I just hope to be a rather quicker one than I was a person. I'm told that at this juncture you have people reading Goethe, which means that uh, despite talk about planetary consciousness, global intellectual development, uh, citizen of the world, Goethe is terribly important to especially Germans. Uh, why not Shakespeare? Why not uh, Moliere? Why not, uh, oh, Pushkin? Why not a whole lot of people? Why not the great Moldavian poet whose name escapes me at this moment? Uh, why not the great... Uh, uh, that's a good one, uh, a Macedonian uh, writer. Uh, no, 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 c c keep the Greeks quiet. It's not Firom, that ridiculous name invented to please them, former Yugoslav Republic of Macedonia. It's Macedonia, the Republic of Macedonia. Well, now that we've cleared that up, I'm very interested in Goethe for one thing, because we shot a film a part of a documentary about Mendelssohn in Goethe's house in Weimar. They didn't allow us in. They did allow us in eventually in order to photograph the house, but we were not allowed to talk because the place was by now of such holiness to the Germans that Goethe's spirit must be untroubled in there by other human voices. I got so fed up with this, I made myself an identity card, as though it was some American uh, CIA, and did a drawing of Goethe on it, and called myself Wolf Gurdy, a uh, US citizen, and had free access to all the sacred places in Germany and the whole world, because we're here to protect all you fine people. And uh, <clears throat> I just found that my way of protesting against something that Goethe, had he been alive today, would have found intolerable, that one can't open one's mouth in his presence. He was a very good listener, as well as a great poet. He listened to Beethoven, he listened to all of them. And there's that wonderful anecdote with him and Beethoven. You've probably never heard it, and if I'm not allowed to finish, you never will. But they were walking together down the street in Weimar when two archdukes came walking in the other direction. And Goethe said to Beethoven, come on, out, out of the way, out of the way, and prepared to bow. And Beethoven either pretended not to hear or couldn't hear, but he walked right through the arch, uh, archdukes. As Beethoven, wrapped in thought, walked through them, both archdukes bowed to Beethoven and then went on their way. When Beethoven had walked far enough, he turned round in time to see the archdukes walking as they were before and Goethe in the ditch. And Beethoven waited for Goethe to catch up with him, so you see. You must realize there are thousands of them and only two of us.
but I think all the questions are there already. I think uh, we're only waiting for an answer. I, I hope we never get one, really. Uh, again, to revert to my book, at the end, God goes back to heaven. Uh, launching pad is Mount Everest, because it's, uh, it's the shortest travel. And uh, the devil goes down the Ganges with a television set, which he hopes to take to hell, because he hasn't seen one yet. Uh, and uh, they disappear each in their own direction. The only people in the world who suspected that they were something out of the usual are some uh, Indian monks. Um, and uh, they suspect that they are holy people and therefore follow the corpse of, he of Satan throwing rose flowers into the Ganges. And at the end, the chief holy man says to the other ones, we are very close to an eternal mystery. And I must say I'm very glad that we didn't discover it, the secret, because now we can go on being holy men without interruption. That's very much what I feel about it. It's once again the feeling that perfection is inaccessible, but it means we always have to reach for it in the hope we'll catch it, and in the secret hope that we never will. Because perfection is death. It's boring. It has no personality. That's one of the secrets of life. In order to have personality, you can't be perfect.